Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to uh, Joe and Nick. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, so let's see. So as, uh, as the title says, so what, what I'll be talking about is uh, symplectic homology. So this is, um, this is an important uh, invariant in, uh, in um, symplectic topology. Uh, the idea is basically that um, so you have this machinery of Hamiltonian Fleur homology um, that allows you to study um, originally when it was introduced it was for the study of closed symplectic manifolds and uh, symplectic homology is, a, is basically a, uh, an extension of this tool for a certain important class of open manifolds okay so uh, um, what I'm going to tell you about is a way of uh, a procedure for computing symplectic homology in certain very restricted cases. Um, symplectic homology, uh, there, there, are some, um, there are some computations of it. It's known, for instance, when the, when the symplectic manifold is a cotangent bundle, uh, it's known that it's symplectic homology uh, is the homology of the free loop space of the base of the cotangent bundle. Uh, but um, uh, it's it's good to have techniques for being able to compute this, uh, this invariant in, uh, in other examples um, because, uh, um, well, it's an invariant that has proven to, to be useful uh, in symplectic topology. So, uh, okay, so what I want to tell you, let's, uh, so as written on the board, so first I'll tell you what, what are the um, special manifolds that I'll be considering, what, um, what is the setup that I'll take, then I'll tell you about what Hamiltonians to um, consider. Um, then I'll tell you, so symplectic homology is a, um, is a homology. Uh, so we need a, a chain complex and we need a differential. Uh, in, uh, in part three, uh, split symplectic homology, I'll tell you about how to get a hand on the differential. Um, and then the, the most important part is uh, this step four. Uh, in which um, we'll discuss um, basically how to um, how to relate the the what you count what you count in the differential of this symplectic homology with uh, some other um, objects that are hopefully more um, more understandable and then in step five we'll actually try to relate those with uh, uh, counts of holomorphic curves uh, hence. Uh, with uh, with gromov witten theory. Okay, so uh, so let me begin with a setup. So, as I told you, uh, it, symplectic homology is uh, a homology theory for a certain class of open manifolds. So uh, let me tell you what what those are uh, in our case. So we'll start with uh, with uh, a closed symplectic manifold uh, X. Um, and uh, let's assume that it's monotone. It's just a, a, a technical assumption that says that C1 of x is some uh, multiple of the symplectic form. And I require this multiple to be positive. Um, it's just, uh, if you're not familiar with this, just think of this as some uh, useful technical assumption to make the, the machinery that I'll use work. Um, Suppose also that uh, uh, omega uh, is, uh, is integral, so it uh, can actually be represented by a, an integral homology class. And then inside x, inside my closed manifold, I'll, um, I'll have a, a symplectic divisor. So uh, this is also, so it's a symplectic divisor. It's, uh, So the restriction of the symplectic form to this uh, co-dimension two submanifold is um, is also a symplectic form, and I, I demand that this new symplectic manifold uh, also be monotone. And uh, okay, and um, I'll also require um, an additional. Um, I also make an additional assumption that. Uh, that the homology class that this submanifold represents is Poincare dual to some positive multiple of, uh, of omega. 
So my symplectic uh, um, class, uh, my symplectic form gives me uh, uh, an integer homology class, and I require that the positive multiple of it, uh, sorry, the symplectic form gives me a cohomology class, and I require that a, a positive multiple of it to be Poincare dual to my symplectic form, my, uh, my divisor, my symplectic divisor. So this is just some, some positive number. Okay, so that's it. That's my setup. And um, so what I will want is to uh, study the symplectic homology of a manifold which is the complement of this divisor. Okay? So I have this is a picture for x. I have my divisor here. The, when I remove it, I get an open manifold, and uh, what I want is to study the symplectic homology of this open manifold. So uh, uh, let me just say that um, there's, uh, there's some interesting classes of examples that uh, this uh, framework fits into, so that fit into this framework. So uh, um, in, uh, in symplectic topology, there's this uh, important result of, uh, of Donaldson's that says that uh, if, you, if you allow your k, basically if you allow your k to be big enough, then uh, you're able to find um, symplectic submanifolds, symplectic hypersurfaces that um, co-dimension two symplectic submanifolds that are Poincare dual to uh, uh, some big enough multiple of omega. So, uh, so that's a source of uh, that's a source of examples. Even even better uh, if you very often if you let uh, x be just some uh, projective variety and uh, and sigma. Uh, something like a, an ample divisor, then um, then you're able to uh, uh, very often satisfy the conditions of this uh, that we imposed. And um, this this second case of projective varieties with uh, with ample divisors is actually uh, the one that we'll be the most interested in because uh, we'll eventually uh, want to uh, reduce our symplectic homology computations to um, to counts of certain uh, holomorphic spheres in sigma and in x, and uh, there's there's some nice tools from there's some nice results from gromov witten theory that we can sometimes import and um, and uh, and use in these uh, in these algebraic geometry cases. So uh, okay, so so that's my setup. Uh, just before I just before I continue, let me just say a little bit more about uh, what happened. What I'm going to what I'm going to uh, say is that in this case uh, I can take some some tub tubular neighborhood I can choose some small tubular neighborhood of uh, of sigma um, such that so such that the boundary of u I can put myself in a position that the boundary of u is a contact manifold. So uh, it um, it um, so I can if I if I make my choices wisely my uh, so my y is the boundary of uh, of uh, a tubular neighborhood so it uh, I can think of it as an S one bundle over uh, over my divisor sigma and um, and uh, I can actually choose a contact form uh, such that it's uh, so. If you have a contact form on a contact manifold, then you have an induced um, rev vector field, and I can choose my contact form such that the rev vector field just flows along these S1 fibers. Okay, so the rev vector field flows along the fibers. So this contact form is what's called a, a more spot contact form because uh, uh, it's periodic rib orbits. Are, are not uh, are not even isolated. Uh, they come in uh, in families, uh, and in this case, if you think about it, e so my y is an S1 bundle. Every point in y is on some fiber, and then you can, if you just go along that fiber, you get a, a periodic orbit. So you can think of periodic orbits as being parameterized by points in y, and by an integer that tells you how often you go uh, around an orbit, uh, such a fiber, a fiber of y. Corresponding fiber. Okay, 
So, um, so I want to say that rib orbits uh, correspond to points in Y and positive integers. Uh, I'm thinking of parameterized rib orbits for the for the moment. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, also, here, so for for technical reasons, uh, the um, it's useful when when talking about uh, symplectic homology to consider. So here, if I remove, you see, x is some uh, manifold with um, it's a closed manifold, so it has finite um, symplectic volume. If I remove the divisor and I keep the symplectic form, uh, I, I still have finite volume. For, uh, for technical reasons, for the machinery, to, to use Fleur's machinery, we, uh, we want a, a symplectic manifold uh, that's open, but that has, in some sense, an infinite end. Okay, so what I'm going to do is actually uh, consider not just the complement of the divisor, but let me, let me put it like this. I'm going to consider this... Uh, this manifold, which is x minus the tubular neighborhood of the divisor, and then union something looking like um, something looking like a, a half infinite interval times y. Uh, so, so this, so if this is uh, if this is my x minus u, it has some boundary which is my uh, contact manifold Y, and then I just attach a half infinite cylinder along it. So this is this is a cartoon for my W. Okay. So it's so this is the W. So this W is the manifold, the symplectic manifold in which I'll be doing Fleur theory. Okay. All right. And uh, and throughout, um, it's good to have an example in mind. So the so the example that uh, that we'll have in mind is uh, when X is CP1 times CP1. And uh, my divisor is just the diagonal uh, CP1. Okay. So this is just a, this is a cartoon for it. And then uh, it turns out that uh, my, uh, my Y, my contact boundary, is just a copy of RP3. Okay. All right. So let me know if there's any questions at this point. So this is my setup, and uh, this is the example that I'll always have in mind in what uh, in everything I'll, I'll say. Okay. So um, all right. So let me tell you now about uh, the the Hamiltonians that we need. So um, so symplectic homology. So symplectic homology, as I was saying, is uh, is some. Uh, some um, analog of uh, Hamiltonian Fleur homology for, um, uh, for these open manifolds. Um, Hamiltonian Fleur homology is motivated by uh, Morse homology. For Morse homology, you need an auxiliary Morse function. For Fleur homology, you need uh, an auxiliary Hamiltonian. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the Hamiltonians that we'll consider. So Hamiltonians. So... Uh, so, say this is my my sketch of what W looks like. Okay, it has this in half infinite end, and then it has this compact region here. Okay, so let me let's suppose that uh, this is the. Let me try to now sketch. Uh, a Hamiltonian. So, uh, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, so here, let me call R. Let me call R the coordinate in this half infinite end. Okay. So now, this here is uh, um, these uh, in this coordinate axis here. I, I write e to the r, and then here I'll draw the Hamiltonian. So my Hamiltonian will be fairly special. So there's this, uh, there's this um, uh, hypersurface, there's this copy of y. Uh, and then above this, this you can think of as y cross 0. 
where zero is uh, contained in this interval. Okay, so above this uh, above this copy of y, you have this r parameter, and so we'll suppose that our Hamiltonian is actually going to be zero below that value of r. Excuse it, and then it grows very fast like this. Okay, so uh, so suppose that this is a picture of a function uh, h, small h, and my, so my Hamiltonian is going to be a function of my radial direction only, and it's going to be of the form small h of e to the r, where the graph of small h is like this, okay? It's kind of like not the, not the usual way to draw the graph of a function. This is the independent variable. This is the dependent variable here, okay? So I just have some function small h, which is zero uh, all the way till this level, and then it starts growing very fast. Um, and, um, and I take my Hamiltonian to be h of e to the r, okay? And growing very fast just means that the derivative uh, of the function small h goes to, infin goes to infinity as r goes to infinity, okay? So I have a, a, a Hamiltonian which depends only on this radial direction and which grows very fast. <coughs> All right. So so now I'm interested in uh, doing Hamiltonian Fleur theory for this type of Hamiltonian, okay? Let me just say b before, before I continue, this, these types of Hamiltonian are extremely, extremely degenerate in the following sense. So. Um, for Hamiltonian Fleur theory, we, what we need to do is study one periodic orbits for the, our chosen Hamiltonian. Okay? Those are the analogs of critical points of a Morse function when you're doing Morse theory. And, um, but here, the periodic orbits of, my, of the Hamiltonian vector field associated with this Hamiltonian, they come in some big dimensional families. For instance, here, up to the, the region where the Hamiltonian, well, in the region where the Hamiltonian is zero, so up to this level, basically every point or every point in my manifold is going to be uh, um, a periodic orbit just because the Hamiltonian vector field is, uh, is zero, okay? And, uh, and then let's see what happens when my Hamiltonian starts to increase. So uh, there's a simple calculation that tells me that um, my Hamiltonian vector field, let me denote it like this, is given by h prime of e to the r times the rib vector field, okay? So the Hamiltonian vector field is a multiple of the rib vector field. And then as I move, uh, as my radial parameter increases, the multiple will also increase, okay? Because the, the, the derivative, so I'm assuming that the derivative of uh, function h is increasing. Uh, is actually going to infinity. So, um, sorry, I'm assuming that the derivative is positive and going to infinity. Uh, so, um, all right, so, so then what happens? So, let's look at this expression. When does this expression give me a one parameter family? When does this vector field have um, one periodic orbits? Well, what I need is, I'll, I'll need a uh, a periodic rib orbit whose, um, whose period is this value here, okay? So when the period is that value there, I get, uh, uh, when the period of my uh, rib orbit uh, is that value there, then I get a one periodic orbit of this Hamiltonian vector field. So now let's recall what are the periodic rib orbits. So the periodic rib orbits are just fibers of my, uh, of this, of this vibration, okay? They can have period one, two, three, any positive number. So the, the one periodic orbits of my Hamiltonian vector field that are not constant are just going to correspond to the, are just going to live in the R values where H prime of E to the R is some positive integer, okay? So, uh, so then, one periodic orbits are going to come two flavors. So as, I, as we've said, we have constants uh, where the 
Hamiltonian vector field is equal to zero. And um, we have uh, non-constant. And, uh, and these will live in, uh, um, so, these, so these correspond to rib orbits of period uh, h prime of e to the r when this is a positive integer. All right. So let's, let's consider these two cases separately. So here, in this case, we have this uncountable number of uh, constant periodic orbits. We, we want to uh, construct a, uh, a FLIR um, chain complex out of it. What we do is we use the, we use the general, uh, we use the idea of uh, Morse spot homology. So uh, when you have, when you have, when you're trying to study a Morse, when you're trying to study a function, when you're trying to do Morse theory on a function that's not actually Morse because it has, uh, um, because its critical points form manifolds, then you can use an auxiliary Morse function on these critical uh, manifolds and uh, take the, the critical points of those auxiliary Morse functions as pairs of your chain complex to, uh, that computes Morse homology. So what we're going to do here is, again, we're going to use some auxiliary Morse functions, and we're going to take the critical points of those auxiliary Morse functions to be the generators of our FLIR complex. So uh, in this case here, we take an auxiliary Morse function FW from W to R. Okay. So W, again, is this whole manifold. So we take an auxiliary Morse function whose critical points are just located here in this compact region where the Hamiltonian was zero, and then just grows maybe radially uh, in, the, in the radial direction. Okay. And then we're going to take the critical points of that auxiliary Morse function to correspond to be the, the FLIR, ge the generators of the FLIR complex corresponding to constant orbits. Okay. Now let's deal with the non-constant orbits. So as we've argued, for every r value where e to the r, where h prime of e to the r is a positive integer, we're going to get, uh, an, uh, again, a y, uh, a y parameter family of, uh, of generators. Okay? So now my, uh, my uh, non-constant uh, periodic orbits are going to be, again, y families, un uh, count sorry, countably many, um, so one for each positive multiplicity, okay? So we're going to have the, the, uh, the Y family corresponding to when this value, when, uh, to the value of R where this, when this quantity is 1, and then when this quantity is 2, we're going to get another copy of Y, and so on, okay? So, uh, so in this case here, we have, um, we, what we need is, so our manifolds of non of uh, non-constant orbits are going to be parameterized by y, so we need some auxiliary Morse function on y. And um, actually, what we're going to do is, so for this, we need an auxiliary Morse function on y. Recall that y is uh, an S1 bundle over sigma, so actually, we'll actually do more spot, think of doing more spot on this uh, uh, y manifold. So what we do is we take a, a Morse function on sigma, and then for every critical point, for every critical uh, point in sigma, you have an S1 fiber, and then take auxiliary Morse functions on those critical S1s. Um, so you get over each critical point in sigma, you get two critical points in the, in the fiber. Just choose Morse functions on S1 with two critical points, and uh, and so this gives me a description of the uh, generators that go into the FLIR chain complex that correspond to non-constant orbits, okay? So we need an auxiliary Morse function on Y. Take a Morse function in sigma and, uh, and Morse function, Morse functions on the critical fibers, we 
which are copies of S1. All right. So if you notice, what you get is for every critical, so, so given Q, a uh, critical point of this Morse function F sigma, the Morse function on the divisor. So this guy has an S1 family of orbits uh, living over it. Uh, I take an auxiliary Morse function on that S1. So this will give me two generators, one corresponding to the minimum, one corresponding to the maximum. Let me call the minimum, the one corresponding to the minimum Q check, the one corresponding to the maximum Q hat. It's just some usual terminology. Um, and, uh, and then the multiplicity. So, as, so we've, we've argued that uh, the, the periodic orbits come in these families that are parameterized by the number of times you go around an orbit, uh, you go around the fiber, I'm sorry. And uh, so we need some index k for that multiplicity. Okay? So, so now the, so now I can write a Fleur chain complex for my special Hamiltonian to be, well, so it's going to be the, the Morse chain complex for uh, actually, let's see, for minus FW. Uh, okay, so FW, remember, FW is my auxiliary Morse function in, uh, in W, whose critical points will be living on this compact region. That's, uh, it's those critical points that I'll take as constant generators of my chain complex. If, you, if you're careful with indices, then there's some, uh, you actually need to take minus uh, FW. Let me actually not, not do that. Let me just write the, the Morse complex of FW. We have to be a little bit careful whether we consider FW or minus that. There's also some uh, grading shift, but let's not worry about that. And then we also have a sum over critical points of F sigma of, so for every critical point in F sigma and for every integer uh, k, any positive integer k, turns out x minus, in, our, in the case we'll keep in mind of CP1 times CP1, S min uh, x minus the divisor is just a, a copy of the unit cotangent bundle of S2. Okay, so I'll need, a, I'll need an auxiliary Morse function on my unit cotangent, bun on my unit cotangent bundle, my FW. So uh, let me just draw some, a sunny picture of P star of S2. Okay, let's say that I take this critical point here, this critical point there. Let me call this guy E and this guy C. So now I have my auxiliary Morse function FW. And then I also need an auxiliary Morse function on sigma. Sigma is just an S2. So uh, I just take, let me call this guy small m the minimum, this guy big M the maximum. And so my chain complex in this case is just going to be, is just going to have as generators E, C, and then a sum over positive integers k of z, and then I have small m check, small m hat, big M check, and big M hat. Okay, this is not really very interesting, but uh, I'm just I don't know, I'm just giving this example, this simple example, to show you that everything becomes very explicit in this model. Okay, this is just the simplest case we can consider. Okay, so so far I've only told you about the chain complex, the, the as a as a, a vector, as a as a group, um, and uh, and I haven't yet told you about the differential. Okay, so that's what I what I'm going to do next. So let me know if there's any questions at this point. No 
Okay. All right. So, so now for for the differential, I'm going to tell you about split symplectic homology. So the idea is just uh, is something that uh, is reasonably common. In, it's just to use a technique that's reasonably common in symplectic topology, um, which is so it's a violent procedure people call stretching the neck. So uh, what is it? So uh, we're doing Fleur homology on this uh, manifold with an infinite end, okay? And uh, so Fleur homology is something inspired by Morse homology. In Morse homology, you count gradient flow lines connecting critical points. In Fleur homology, you count your, your generators are no longer critical points, they're periodic orbits. And now you'll count cylinders connecting these periodic orbits and satisfying a certain equation that generalizes the gradient flow equation. That's the Fleur equation, okay? And then your Fleur differential will be counting cylinders connecting some periodic orbits, right? But uh, so what will we do? So um, let's suppose that uh, this here is this uh, copy of Y where above which the Hamiltonian is, uh, is non-zero and below which it's actually zero. Let's actually suppose that uh, the Hamiltonian, the, the support of the Hamiltonian is located a bit above this copy of Y, okay? So let's suppose that the Hamiltonian is already zero a bit above this copy of Y. Okay, so now what we'll do is uh, this copy of Y, this is a contact manifold inside my uh, symplectic manifold. And uh, so it's, it's called a contact type hypersurface. And uh, in these situations, we can do uh, we can perform this uh, this procedure in symplectic homology in, <laughs> in symplectic topology, which is called stretching the neck. Basically, what uh, what we do is we modify the manifold. Actually, I'm not really telling you. Uh, I'm not really telling you uh, some details. But so, just like in uh, Morse theory, uh, you need an auxiliary, um, for instance, uh, an auxiliary metric. Uh, we'll do. To define your gradient vector, your gradient vector field uh, here in symplectic uh, in symplectic homology in Hamiltonian Fleur theory, you need an, a piece of auxiliary structure which is a, an almost complex structure. So uh, doing the next stretching is modifying the the, the the almost complex structure near near y in such a way that it really looks like you're taking some some small neighborhood of y and you're making it extremely big. You're really stretching that. Uh, like in practical terms, you're stretching this small neighborhood of Y. And then in the limit, what happens is that your Y will break into pieces like this. Your W, I'm sorry. The symplectic manifold is W. You're stretching along Y. And then you break. And uh, so what you get in the limit is, again, a copy of W. And here, what you get is a copy of R times Y. This is what's called the symplectization of Y. OK, so now what we want to see is what happens to these Fleur cylinders uh, when you do this next stretching procedure. And, uh, and for a lot of cylinders, nothing really happens because, uh, well, uh, they're, if, they, if they're kind of far enough up on your uh, W, it's th those cylinders will actually not see the violent behavior that's happening near y, okay? But uh, so this is what you get in the limit. Um, so what we do, so what we're doing here is we're starting with a Fleur cylinder in W for this fixed almost complex structure, and then we're going to change the almost complex structure, and we're going to try to follow the the cylinder as we make this change and see what happens, what it should correspond to in this limit when the manifold actually breaks into these pieces. And uh, so for some cylinders, nothing really happens, that meaning after you stretch the neck, you get a cylinder living in the symplectization. But for some other cylinders, for instance, if you have a cylinder that's, uh, that's, uh, that's traveling around a bit uh, in W and that goes through the, into this compact region, this uh, cylinder uh, gets basically this uh, bubble cut off from it. And so in the limit, It should correspond to a configuration like this, OK? So now what we have here is before we stretched the neck, we had a cylinder in uh, W satisfying a certain equation. Now after we stretched the neck, that cylinder got chopped into two pieces. One is a cylinder with a puncture 
still satisfying a Fleury equation in R times Y. And then there's some plane that bubbled off into W. And uh, that, uh, so here notice, I'm telling you that uh, the Hamiltonian, the support of the Hamiltonian uh, does not include this compact region. So here, this, uh, this plane will solve a Fleury equation for a zero Hamiltonian, so it will just solve a pseudo-holomorphic curve equation. Okay, so now this plane is solving a pseudo-holomorphic curve equation, and uh, this punctured cylinder is still solving a Fleury equation. Okay, why did we do this? Well, the, the reason what we gained from this was that um, now our, the Fleur problem, the, the, the Hamiltonian, is supported only on this simplexization uh, direction. And, uh, and here I really have a lot of symmetry. I have this R translation symmetry, and I also have my uh, uh, S1 symmetry. So recall Y, keep in, y, keep in mind that Y is an S1 bundle over sigma. So this, uh, this simplexization of Y, R times Y, has this S1 action that's going to be crucial, actually, for the, for the rest of our argument. So that's what we gain. When we stretch the neck, now the relevant um, information what we still don't understand so well uh, is, uh, is living in this uh, manifold with S1 action. Okay. Uh, so SFT compactness tells you you could have, but uh, uh, at actually for the, for the cases that we'll consider, if you just start with a Fleur cylinder of index 1, then you're, you're actually not going to have more than mm, two levels. All right. And terms of cellular, I'm not really going to, to say much about, but uh, I'm starting with um, this assumption that uh, my divisor is monotone and that uh, X is monotone so that I can actually import uh, uh, a J in my divisor that makes pseudo-holomorphic spheres transverse there to, uh, to produce uh, some special J in the simplexization for which, after some work, I get transversality for all the relevant curves. Okay. All right. Any other questions? So, uh, so now step four. Uh, step four is just about studying Fleur cylinders in the simplexization. Okay. And when I say Fleur cylinders, I mean cylinders with possi possibly with kept by planes in W. Okay, why do I say I have an ansatz for those? There's going to be a, I'm going to be able to apply a trick here using my, using very crucially all my symmetry, all the symmetry that I have, all this S1 symmetry in Y, to actually study, uh, be able to say something very explicit about the Fleur cylinders in the simplexization. All right, so, uh, so let's suppose, let me just uh, introduce a little bit of notation. So just to, to call names to the, to give names to these uh, cylinders. So let's, let's say that I write B comma V. Let me call B comma V the components of, uh, of a Fleur cylinder uh, whose domain is a cylinder minus some punctures that are going to get capped in W, okay? And uh, so this is mapping to the simplexization of Y. I call B the, the component mapping to R and uh, V the component mapping to Y. So let me say that this is a Fleur cylinder. Punctured, I won't be saying punctured, but uh, I'm assuming this implicitly um, that it's possibly Yeah, it's a radial Hamiltonian. It only depends on the radial direction. I know, but when, once, when, so once we sort of have, we're in the R invariant sort of setup, we still have a non-R invariant gauge. And That's right. It tends to zero, which is a minus infinity, is that? It's actually eventually zero. Oh, in finite time. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, but here I only have. I, I thought we made perturbations at the start. We made perturbations in W, and then we made perturbations on the, on the, on the boundary, so that it wasn't going to be zero. No, we, we're not making perturbations. So, so this is really a more spot computation, okay? And then, so we need. Yeah, but if it's, if it's zero, if it's zero in finite time, then it's, the Hamiltonian's not more spot than that boundary. So you're using zero ones to get the boundary. 
I agree, I agree. But, uh, but here, at this point now, I will only study, um, I will only study uh, cylinders whose, uh, whose, um, whose asymptotic orbits live in the non-zero, non in the region where the Hamiltonian is not actually zero. Okay, so I've started, well, I, so I've started with, um, that's also because of what I chose to tell you. So, so uh, here I'm, I'm looking at the Fleur cylinder that connects um, periodic orbits in this region where the Hamiltonian is non-zero, okay? And then I stretch the neck and I get a punctured cylinder that also has period, is also asymptotic to periodic orbits where the Hamiltonian is non-zero. I also have to address cylinders connecting uh, periodic orbits with constant orbits, okay? And, uh, and those I'll also have to deal with with a slightly different argument, okay? But, uh, but for the time being, I'm only really considering these. And for these, I mean, the, just by construction, the, the asymptotic orbits are living in the region where the Hamiltonian is not zero. All right, great. So, uh, so now I have a Fleur cylinder here. Um, and uh, I want to consider, what do I want to consider? I want to consider, so suppose J is, uh, so J is my almost complex structure on, uh, on W. So I had my almost complex structure in W. It was my auxiliary piece of information that I needed to define the Fleur equation. Then I did the next stretching. I get also an almost complex structure. I get an induced almost complex structure in, uh, again, in W and in the simplexization. Let me assume that the, the almost complex structure I get in uh, R cross Y is S1 invariant, okay? Rib S1 invariant. So it's invariant under this rotation along the fibers, okay? This is, a, this is an important assumption. It turns out with some work that uh, we, can, we can get transversality even with this symmetry of J, okay? It's, uh, it's not an obvious thing, but, uh, but one can do it. And then with this very special a uh, class of almost complex structures uh, in hand, we can, uh, we can simplify, we can say, some, we can say a lot about the, the Fleur cylinders. So, so let, me, uh, let me write here a, a proposition. So what we have is that uh, this proposition will, um, will tell me something about, will in this proposition, I'll just restrict my attention to a very special class of Fleur cylinders. So suppose uh, that B comma B, so now there's gonna be just a little bit of notation. So let me write it first and then explain what I mean. So suppose that my B comma B, my Fleur cylinder, is of this form. So A plus F1 comma rib flow for time F2 of U, where, so A comma U from uh, the cylinder, same domain, cylinder minus punctures into R cross Y is uh, J holomorphic and my F1 comma F2 is just a map from the cylinder to the cylinder, and uh, phi sub r t is rib flow for time t. Okay. So these are these are the assumptions of uh, of the result. So they just say that my Fleur cylinder it has components b comma v where there's some auxiliary pseudo holomorphic. Uh, J holomorphic uh, cylinder, okay? So now this A comma U are the components of, a, of a, a map that satisfies not Fleur's equation, but the pseudo holomorphic curve equation, which is simpler, okay? But, uh, but well, my cylinder is not, I mean, it satisfies a different equation. It's not the J holomorphic. So B comma V are the components of a Fleur cylinder, not of a J holomorphic uh, cylinder. But how do I get from a J holomorphic cylinder to the Fleur cylinder, well, what I have to do is 
on the first component, oh, this on the first component, I need to add to A some map, F1. Okay, the domain is a cylinder, so the first component maps to R. So I'm just adding some function to to the to the first component of the J-holomorphic uh, cylinder. And then on the second component, what I do is I take the, the second component of my J-holomorphic cylinder and I rotate it. I use the rep flow to rotate that component, to rotate that function uh, by some amount of time that depends on my point on the domain. Okay? So now, so phi t, phi t r is the rep flow for time t. Okay? And I'm introducing a new function f2 that parameterizes, that tells me how much time I need to flow. Um, okay? So that takes values in S1. Okay, so these are just the, the assumptions. These are just the hypothesis. Sorry? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So, um, so what I'm saying is if my Fleur cylinder is obtained from a holomorphic cylinder by some translation of this kind, then then it turns out that uh, F1 comma F2 solves a simple a simple PDE which is DF1. Let me just write it for completeness, just to show you that uh, it's a fairly simple PDE. Okay, so F1 and F2 are the components of a map from the cylinder to the cylinder. Okay, I, I'm going to think of those as, um, so, okay, I'm going to take those and I'm going to write this equation. Well, if I didn't have this Hamiltonian term, this would be something looking very much like a Cauchy-Riemann equation for the map F1 comma F2 from the cylinder to itself. But it's not a, uh, a Cauchy-Riemann equation. It has this perturbation, but the perturbation is fairly explicit and uh, it depends only on the A, the, the, the first component of my uh, J-holomorphic curve, okay? So this is, this, is, this is not a very transparent proposition, okay? But what I'm saying is, um, and there's going to be a hopefully more transparent other result that uses this proposition, but what the proposition is saying is just that if my Fleur cylinders uh, are very special in the sense that they're obtained from J holomorphic cylinders by some kind of by some um, translation controlled by these functions F1 and F2, then these functions F1 and F2 solve a fairly explicit PDE that I can uh, uh, devote my attention to now. Okay? And, uh, and the next result. So the theorem is the following. So there's two parts. The first part says that because I've made my very special choice, because I've made my choice of J to be very special, my J has a lot of symmetry in it. Uh, because I've made that choice, actually all Fleur cylinders are of this form. All Fleur cylinders come from J Hamiltonian, uh, from a J holomorphic, well, from J-holomorphic cylinders um, that get modified by this function F1, F2, okay? So all Fleur cylinders are of this form, okay? That's the first step of the result. And the second step of the result it's saying that I actually have a bijection. So, uh, well, sorry, let me actually state the bijection here. Not only are all Fleur cylinders of this form, but um, they're of this form in a basically unique way. So I have a bijection between uh, Fleur cylinders and Because of my special choice of J, I have a bijection between Fleur cylinders and uh, J holomorphic cylinders plus uh, solutions F1, 
comma f2 of this uh, this PDE that I'm calling star. Okay. And then here, I mean, actually, you see, I have to construct the Fleur cylinder. I start with the holomorphic curve and the, the functions f1, f2, and I kind of combine them together by basically adding them. So th there is some ambiguity here, right? I could add something to the holomorphic curve and subtract it from uh, uh, f1, f2. So I have to mod out by these automorphisms, r cross s1. But if I mod out, I get a one-to-one -one correspondence between Fleur cylinders and J holomorphic curves, J holomorphic cylinders, plus solution of my auxiliary equation. So now what I have to do is I have to dedicate my attention to studying this uh, equation star. And then the second bullet point in this result is that is the following. So now I'm going to dedicate my attention to only, I'm going to look at only the differential in Fleur homology. The differential count counts solutions of Fleur's equation of index 1, wherever the index is, there's some index. Uh, and uh, when the index is 1, the, 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 the solutions of the Fleur equation are in some sense rigid. Those are the ones that I, that I want to count. And it turns out that if I make this index assumption, so if uh, the index of the Fleur cylinder is 1, then star has basically unique solutions. Okay, so what I mean is that, uh, so I have to, so the, the, the index of the Fleur problem is basically a sum of the index of the holomorphic problem with the index of this auxiliary problem. Mm -hmm. So I want that guy to be one. Well, that guy can be one when this is 0, this is 1, or this is 1 and this is 0. Well, when this is, the index of this guy is 0, there's actually a unique solution. When the index of this thing is 1, there's, there's not a unique solution, but there's like a, a one-parameter family of solutions that one can understand fairly explicitly. Okay, so even when it's not, uh, and, and you know, uh, I mean, I, I need to have an R parameter to mod out uh, my, to get a moduli space of first solutions. And uh, so I can understand that fairly explicitly. That's why I say basically. For practical purposes, it's saying that uh, uh, whenever I have a Fleur cylinder, I understand completely to worry about this, uh, this part of the problem. I only need a, to, to solve the J holomorphic curve equation. So basically, it's just a comparison That's right, okay. that's right. So yeah, so I, I, need to, I need to worry about, I, I need to be careful with transversality for all these arguments to work, especially these index arguments. Yes, I, one needs to be fairly, fairly careful with this. Okay, but so, any, any other questions? So what I want to say is just to, to summarize, the upshot is, is what? So, First, all Fleur cylinders, so studying Fleur cylinders is the same as studying J holomorphic cylinders and solutions of my auxiliary equation. Then, in the case of Fleur cylinders that I want to consider for the Fleur differential, the auxiliary equation basically has a unique solution. So, this, I can interpret this as a correspondence, a one-to-one -one correspondence between Fleur cylinders and J holomorphic cylinders in the simplectization. Okay. So, the upshot is that Fleur cylinders correspond to J holomorphic cylinders in the simplectization, okay? All right, so, so that's, that's the ansatz. And so, I so this is an ansatz because we chose a fairly, fairly uh, uh, special kind of J, very symmetric, and then we asked ourselves, well, what are the, what are the nicest possible Fleur solutions? Let's just dedicate our attention to those. And then it turns out that those are really all that you have to consider, OK? So that's, that's the ansatz. And then phi, finally, what's the relation with uh, gromov witten theory? So, so now, I mean, th this part now is actually 
fairly simple. So, uh, so now what do we have? So now, from this point on, I only focus on J holomorphic cylinders in the simplectization, Poss cylinders possibly with punctures. Okay. So let me let's take one such guy. So this is my J holomorphic cylinder, a comma u mapping to R comma y. Now what I'm going to do is, so I have my R comma y. Remember, y is an S1 bundle over my divisor. So let me just project everything down to sigma. OK. So I have a map from my cylinder minus punctures mapping to sigma. Well, so this turns out, uh, so as usual in Fleur theory and in the business of J-holomorphic curves, you only really care about curves that have finite energy in some very precise sense. And uh, these curves, they have punctures, OK, plus and minus infinity and the other punctures. And uh, for the energy, for the relevant energy to be finite, these uh, puncture, the, the, the maps, this map on punctures needs to actually converge to rib orbits at plus or at minus infinity. And uh, let's, th let's recall in our, in our picture, rib orbits are bundle. So if you have something that's converging to a fiber of this S1 bundle and you project down to sigma, you're going to get something that projects down to a point. Okay? So what I'm trying to argue here is that uh, this map, when you project down to sigma, you get a removable singularity. And you get a map not just from this domain into sigma, but from CP1 into sigma. So you get a J-holomorphic sphere in sigma. And that's the relation. That's the relation, really, with Gromov-Witten theory, because uh, um, so now what we see is that Fleur cylinders, to st the, the study of Fleur cylinders, ends up being the study of J-holomorphic cylinders in R times Y, and then when you project those to sigma, what you get is a J-holomorphic sphere in sigma. Well, this is not the complete story because we've thrown away uh, a bunch of it, some information when we projected down to sigma, right? But uh, turns out that uh, you can try to keep track of this extra information that you, that you uh, uh, threw away in the following way. So, this, so y is an S1 bundle over sigma. I multiply, I cross it with r. I can think of this as the complement of the zero section of some uh, line bundle over sigma. Okay? So let me write this as some line bundle minus the zero section over sigma, OK? And uh, I have this J holomorphic map. Let me call it W. I can actually pull back this line bundle uh, over W. So I get now I have some complex line bundle living over my CP1. And it turns out that the information that I lost when I did this procedure, when I when I project it down to sigma, it's contained in some meromorphic section of this line bundle over CP1. But now, meromorphic sections of line bundles over CP1 are objects that we can study fairly explicitly. So, um, so there is some information that goes into that uh, that gets forgotten when you project down to sigma, but we can actually recover it fairly explicitly. So, in the end, the meat. What, uh, what contains relevant information to be able to reconstruct the Fleur differential is really J holomorphic maps from uh, spheres into sigma. Okay? And then last sentence is, remember, when we stretched the neck, there was also potentially some holomorphic planes getting left over in uh, W. Those will actually correspond to J holomorphic spheres in, uh, in X having some point touching the divisor. So this is uh, uh, what people, this, these are the kinds of objects that show up when people study relevant, relative Gromov-Witten theory, for instance. So uh, you also have techniques to deal with this, leftover, this stuff that was left over in W. Okay? So then in the end, um, the point is that one is able to reconstruct the full Fleur differential in, uh, for this manifold W all in terms of uh, J-holomorphic spheres in X and in sigma. Okay, so that's the relation between uh, J holomorph between symplectic homology and uh, Gromov-Witten theory. I'm out of time, but uh, uh, with more time, one could go over this example and see exactly what are the spheres that show up and uh, how they 
uh, how you can use those to construct the, the fur differential that, uh, that actually counts the, that actually computes the, the correct answer. In that case, I mean, W is uh, the cotangent bundle of S2, and as I've said before, its symplectic homology is just the homology of the loop space. And this is known for spheres, so we have an answer that we can compare with. Um, and, uh, and so one can show that uh, this procedure just produces exactly the, the same answer that you get from, from string topology. Okay, I went a few minutes over time. I'm sorry about that. And uh, thank you for your attention.